This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. So, thank you very much to the invitation to this uh, beautiful conference. And uh, I think my talk will have something to do also with... Uh, Philips uh, about uh, women and dragons. It is actually my first uh, English conference talk, so when you, if you don't understand something, please interrupt me. And let's begin. Uh, we know that the ancient Greek hero Perseus plays a fundamental role in Warburg's uh, essay on uh, Schifanoia Pallas. It is now during the Kreuzlingen confinement that uh, Perseus seems to become more and more important in uh, Varug's meditation. With his fight against the, against the monster Medusa, Perseus is, as uh, Varug writes in a letter from Kreuzlingen in 1924, the symbol of the world directed energy, Weltzugewandte Energie. And only a few hours before his death, the last notes Varbu writes are Perseus or energetic aesthetics as logical orientation in Giordano Bruno. In the myth of Perseus, Varbu uh, sees coming together the two main topics of uh, his research, the pathos formula with the fight against the monster and the astrological topic with uh, Perseus's rising to the sky and uh, becoming a constellation. But what does uh, uh, Perseus exactly <coughs> represent? Or what does energetic aesthetics mean? In the Schifanoia essay, the energy of the Renaissance man was meant as his capacity of uh, overcoming the uh, Middle Ages resignation try to turn uh, destiny to his favor. A symbol of that was the Fortuna with sail that uh, replaces the ancient uh, Fortuna with wheel, the new dynamism of the Renaissance man, so, against the, the ancient uh, fatalism of the Middle Ages. Now, as we saw with the editorial staff of Engramma, working on uh, Engramma 92, which is uh, all about Fortuna, Varug has continued with his uh, meditations on the Fortuna, Fortune topic, until his uh, most mature period. And it is, I think, precisely during the Kreuzingen confinement that the change can be seen. In Kreuzingen, as we know from the texts of the period that Claudia Vedepol has edited together with uh, Davide Stimilli, Barbrook starts working on the forces of destiny, Schicksalmechte in Spiegel Antichisirender Symbolique, forces of destiny in the mirror of the antiquine symbology, is the title of these fragments. In, uh, now in uh, these notes, an important role is given uh, not anymore to, not so much to Perseus, but rather to the beaten monster Medusa and to her sister's wailing to the Gorgon's wailing, from which goddess uh, Athena composed the first flute music. This is Pindar, 12th Pitic Ode. So um, horror and pain find here their redemption in art. This uh, interpretation of the Medusa myth was adopted many years later in a particular sense by Siegfried Krakauer, in a book whose uh, subtitle is exactly The Redemption of Physical Reality, that is Theory of Film. The book was published in uh, 1960, and uh, it shows an evident connection, Marco Bertozzi has worked on that, with uh, Panofsky's film uh, essay, Style and Medium in the Moving Pictures, whose first version was published in 1937, with his Friendship with Panofsky Krakauer was actually successful where Benjamin failed, that is, in, in the attempt to set a connection between the Frankfurter Schule and the Warburg Kreis. 
But to get uh, back to Medusa, we read in uh, Krakauer's stereo film that, I quote, perhaps uh, Perseus's greatest achievement was not to cut off Medusa's head, but to overcome his fears and look at its reflection in the shield. That is, I quote again, to redeem horror from its invisibility. Recently, Georges Duberman returned to this point to claim the necessity and the duty of image in spite of all, image malgré tout, uh, 2005. But uh, here in Barbara's interpretation of the myth of Perseus, this is maybe uh, not exactly or rather not only the point. A signal of that is the unexpected sympathy for uh, Medusa that comes out from the consideration of Perseus's violence. Perseus uh, uh, beheading Medusa corresponds actually in the works of this period to the uh, brutality of, uh, another hero, of another hero, the uh, warrior who grabs Fortuna by the hair on this uh, Renaissance uh, uh, medal. Like with the ancient uh, Ocasio, the uh, Greek Kairos, the demon that uh, should be grabbed by the forelock. What this warrior does, uh, Varbo writes uh, in uh, the postscript to Alfred Doran's lecture, is nothing else than absurd and brutal folly. Because Fortuna, we can see it from uh, its connection with the word Fortunale, windstorm, cannot uh, be caught, except by unfurling, uh, unfurling the sails and keeping the hand on the wheel. Medusa was actually a sea monster. And uh, in a letter of the same period, Perseus is compared to Faust, who tries at the end of the poem to hold back the sea. A Faust who is yet less self-confident and uh, triumphant than the original one, and who in another letter from Kreuzingen is compared in his digging to hold back the sea to Hamlet's grave digger. It can be interesting then that Varbur copies several times inside a very uh, important group of quotes of the same Kreuzingen period that thanks to Eckhart and Claudia I could uh, see in uh, the archive, a letter from uh, Goethe that dates back to a much earlier period, when uh, young Goethe was close to the Sturm und Drang movement. This letter begins with a view of a dangerous sea voyage, I read you the passage, still tossed on the waves in my little boat, and when the stars go out, I just, string al I just drift along in the hand of fate, and courage and hope, fear and quiescence, alternate in my breast. So the protagonists are here of the sea and the waves. The other pole of navigation and of the myth of Perseus, that is the stars, appears in a, another text, Barbu copies in the same Kreuzinger folder, that is Godfrey Keller's invocation to the great bear. We know from uh, the letters of the period that Barbu has been looking for this poem for a long time and when he finally gets the poem, he copies, his, uh, he copies it many times inside this quotation folder. In uh, this poem, Keller invokes from his deathbed the constellation of the great bear, Herr Wagen, Mächtig Sterner Germanen, I also display it because of my German pronunciation, asking it uh, to carry him away like uh, a child who has neither weight nor fault. Keller is a constant presence in the letters Barbara writes from Kreuzingen. He suggests him as a reading to his children. He recalls his novels in a relation with his own experiences. And he desperately looks, as we have seen, for his last poem. And Keller is, as we know, much beloved also by Walter Benjamin. Benjamin's most uh, important mention of Medusa in the Arcades project uh, comes uh, actually from uh, Keller. The end of uh, Baudelaire's poem La Destruction, Destruction, we'll see it uh, later, is described here with a quotation from Keller as the image of petrified unrest. The entire expression that Benjamin quotes straight after is 
war wie ein Medusenschild, der erstarten und ruh bild, was like a Medusa shield image of petrified unrest. The poem these verses come from, I display it here, is uh, uh, again, sorry, the translation I forgot, is again about a star, but a star which is this time uh, uh, under the sea. I had a jewel, says here an old seaman who, ap who appears in his traveling over the sea as the image of a petrified unrest, that helped me in every navigation, and that jewel was the right, but now mm, it's lost, and the star that it was shines in the depth of the sea. So what is lost here is, as the title says, the right, das Recht. But um, in his essay on uh, Keller, Benjamin argues that in Keller's writings, the real right is actually humor. A kind of humor he describes as a submarine, or rather a subterranean movement. Keller humor is, uh, uh, I read you the pas passage, where is it? Uh, I don't have it here, I read it, I hope you understand. A questionable system of grottos and caverns that by imperceptible stages stands, tends to constrain and ultimately to repress the rhythmic bubble of bourgeois voices and opinions in favor of the cosmic rhythms it captures the within the bowels of the earth. If we seek a name for this miracle of grottos and caves, it, ca it can be none other than humor. Keller's gentle and melodious laughter is much at home in these subterranean vaults than Homer's in the heavenly ones. Keller's humor, Benjamin goes on, is not a superficial gilded polish, but the unpredictable ground plan of his half melancholic, half choleric nature. In uh, its own way, humor is itself, Benjamin says, a kind of judicial system it is the universe of enforcement without verdict, a universe in which both verdict and pardon express themselves through laughter. So with the image of the earth tremors uh, uh, that Keller's subterranean humor causes, uh, the energetic topic that Warburg relates to Perseus comes here as well to the fore. These tremors are, Benjamin writes, enforcement without verdict. So it is here the definitive nature of verdict that is called off, because these tremors are, at the same time, with Benjamin words again, verdict and pardon. Now Baudelaire's poem La Destruction ended uh, abruptly with the image of an uncompleted destruction. I show you here the conclusion of the poem in a red color, which Benjamin argues to be the image of the petrified unrest. As Benjamin writes in a, another note of their project, I quote, the bloody implements of destruction, the display of which is thrust upon the poet by the devil, are, with my words, the implements of allegory. With Benjamin's words are allegory's courtyard the strewn implements with which allegory has so disfigured and mould the material world that only fragments remain as the object of its contemplation. The poem itself, Benjamin continues, breaks off abruptly, creating the impression, doubly surprising for a sonnet, of itself being something fragmentary." End of quote. Now this uncompleted destruction Baudelaire's poem ends with is replaced in Keller's uh, subterranean movements with a kind of destruction that is each time, as we have seen, both uh, accomplished and cured until the next earth tremor. We get close this way to Benjamin's second, to Benjamin's second Medusa uh, image. In his first version of the Berliner Kindheit, Berliner Childhood, which was titled Berliner Chronique, Berliner Chronicle, Benjamin uh, writes about a ring that portrayed a Medusa's head. Not the Medusa shield anymore then, but the Medusa itself, her or its head. In um, 
her book The Severed Head, Capital Visions, Giulia Cristeva has written about uh, Medusa's uh, severed head. The severed head becomes, in this book, the symbol of the open wound that affects the visible world. According to Cristeva, the faculty of uh, representing originates actually as a reaction to the mother's loss that the baby experiences as a psychological state. And it is this loss that uh, the severed head the Medusa said, but also Holofernes uh, and uh, St. Uh, John the Baptist, but we can add also with Barbara Gorfeus, it is this loss that uh, the severed head represents. Kristeva's analysis is close here for several aspects uh, to Derrida's. In Derrida's glass, Medusa represents actually inside the Hegel interpretation the other with, with capital O, the original space, the Cora of which image and Aufhebung are only the rest. But uh, the ring Benjamin writes about in the Berliner Chronicle has not, not uh, so much to do with a trace or a rest, like the Medusa's severed head, but rather with a vibrant presence, uh, that is, uh, with Benjamin's words, with the Medusa's deep glowing eyes. I read you uh, the passage, this one I have. It was the most fascinating ring I have, ever s I have never seen. Cut in a dark, solid garnet, it portrayed Medusa's head. Worn, worn on the finger, the ring seemed merely the most perfect of signet rings. You entered its secrets, only taking it off and contemplating the head against the light. As the different strata of the garnet were unequally translucent, the somber body of the snakes seemed to rise above the two deep, glowing eyes which looked out from a face that in the purple-black portions of the cheeks receded once more into the night. Medusa's gaze is now one of the main topics of a book by a scholar who will become uh, quite close to Benjamin in his last French period, Roger Caillois. We know how interested and how critical as well it would be uh, nice to have to have here still uh, Professor Bredekamp to speak about that. How interesting and how critical Benjamin will be towards uh, Caillois, uh, Bataille and the Collège de Sociologie. Now in uh, Medusa et Compagnie, published later in 1960, Caillois writes about a kind of uh, mimetic behavior that produces a motionless glowing circle here on uh, the wings of these butterflies similar to an enormous and uh, hypnotic uh, eye. It is actually a kind of uh, vertigo that the motionless uh, circle produces. Uh, vertigo, here in the extraordinary Hitchcock's version, also with a scene of uh, tree trunk uh, vertigo. Uh, a vertigo that Caillois had already analyzed in uh, Le Demons du Midi, the Noon Tide Demons, 1937, and which is basically an uh, identification with the inanimated world. Verrà la morte avrai tuoi occhi, death will come and will have your eyes, will write a few years later Cesare Pavese. And some uh, more uh, years later, in his essay on Medusa published in 1985, La mort dans les yeux, death in the eyes, Jean-Paul Vernan interprets Medusa's uh, motionless uh, mask gaze as the gaze of what is uh, absolutely other, that is of death, with its uh, chaos and its loss of sense, the same loss of sense the ancient uh, heroic death, La Belle Mort, was trying to remove, uh, according to Vernon. But to go back to Caillois, it is maybe no accident that only a few years before Le Demont du Midi, an Italian scholar, Mario Prazzo, dedicated to the Medusian beauty, the first chapter of his, of his book, La carne e la morte del diavolo, nella letteratura romantica, Flesh, Death and the Devil in Romantic Literature, and that this chapter ends actually with Baudelaire. Actually, Benjamin points out that the eyes in Baudelaire's poetry have the same stillness as that of the mythical creatures Caillois is writing about. Plonge tes yeux dans les yeux fixes, de satires ou de nix, plunge your eyes, into the fixed gaze of satiresses or nixes, Benjamin quotes in the Arcades project from 
Baudelaire's poem L'Advertisseur, the Warner. And also in the second expose he writes for the Arcades project in 1939, Benjamin writes that in Baudelaire's poetry, the face of modernity itself blasts us with an immemorial gaze. Such was the gaze of Medusa for the Greeks, end of quotation. But uh, against the force of myth, another opposite force occurs in uh, Baudelaire's poetry. That is the force of allegory, I quote, it was owing to the genius of allegory that Baudelaire did not succumb to the abyss of myth that kept beneath his feet at every step. The, end of quote, the petrified unrest uh, means then we can say the impossibility for the allegorical image of being uh, the image, the image of death, of the abyss, because for a uh, the genius of allegory, the abyss, has no image, and image is, as we have seen uh, also yesterday with uh, Christopher Stoke, is just a fragment on the brink of it. But this, this is only a step in uh, Benjamin's criticism of myth. The second step concerns more directly the energetic topic that Warburg connects to the figure of Persus. It concerns the earth tremors that Keller's humor causes, and it concerns the glowing gaze of a Medusa ring, which is not like for Caillois' Medusa attraction into the abyss, but rather a light that comes out from it. Opposite to the strength of this light is the ring's fragility. I tried more than once to stamp a seal with this stone, Benjamin writes, but it proved easy to crack and in need of the utmost care." End quote. It brings to mind this the warrior's catch of uh, Fortuna with sails that risks uh, uh, Warburg writes uh, sinking the ship. And it brings to mind, I can find it, Italo's Calvinus Persius, who in the Lezioni Americane, six memos for the next millennium, lays down, according to Ovidio, the, the snake-haired head on a bed of leaves and weeds, so that the raw sand should not harm it. Energy appears so to be connected here with uh, fragility. Let's see in uh, which sense. And with that I come to my uh, third and last part of the talk. Perseus or energetic aesthetics as a logical orientation in Giordano Bruno are, as we have seen, and as Maurizio Gelardi and Claudia Cerevia uh, have recently pointed out, the last notes Varbu writes just before his death. And aesthetics is actually the topic of the international conference Varbu was going to take part in Hamburg a few months later. We'll see, it, uh, we'll see that in, in a moment. In uh, Bruno's uh, Spaccio della Bestia Tronfante, the expulsion of the triumphant beast, that Varbu reads a few months before this note, during his last trip to Italy, Perseus is among the astrological gods who must leave their place uh, in heaven as a consequence of the moral reform of heaven the Olympic gods have undertaken. But Perseus, together with a uh, few others, keeps his commission to perform it on earth. It is again, Varbu writes, his energy that the word, word needs. But again then, what is this energy? Energy for doing what? Right after Lo Spaccio, Varbu, who is still traveling in Italy, reads Bruno's uh, Degli Eroici Furori, the heroic furies or on heroic frenzies. And it is here that, as I will try to show, the two moments of the story of Perseus, the one on earth with the fight with the monster and the one in heaven when he becomes a constellation, it is here that, that these two moments meet. In his notes about Bruno, Varbur copies a long passage from the Furori, which is about the difficulty the human soul has reaching the gods and divinity from the low seat it has. I show you the passage. But although he <coughs> began his trip to investigate the idea of uh, mystical ascent, 
what Farber discovered in it is, as we read in the letters of a period, that ascent and descent have to be considered as one. Let's get back for a moment to the eroici furori. The hunter Atteone, who represents here the enterprise of knowledge, runs at the end of the dialogue into Diana, who is here the symbol of nature, and according to the myth is turned into a deer and eaten by, by his own dogs. So the hunter becomes a prey. Perseus and Medusa turn out to be one thing. But the eroici furori are not a mystical experience in the true sense of the word. Vertigo and oblivion, that Caillois ascribes to the noontide demons, are not the, the heroic frenzy's conclusion. Bruno writes, actually, that the frenzies are not an oblivion, but a memory, not a bestial rapture, but a rational fervor. And Warburg writes about the frenzies that it's the heroic and erotic devotion to chaos and to hule, the material world, that produces here the den crown, the space of thought. Ascent and descent, so together, Perseus and Medusa, man and animal, thought and material world, transform each other. Therein lies, I think, the energetic feature of the ecstatic experience Warburg is here analyzing. In another note of the same period, Warburg writes that, I quote bef first uh, from German, wo die Ethik fort ist und noch keine Philosophie, da kann die Ästhetik Kaffee kochen. When ethics is over and there's still no philosophy, then aesthetics can make coffee. Now we can understand then the value of this proposal. In an historical period where logic and ethics seem to waver, a few years before Caillois Nuntide Vertigo and Pratt's Corrupted Beauty, Warburg indicates the contact with the still formless world of nature and Hülle as the source where a new logic and ethic orientation can and must arise always again. Nature is released this way then from its demonic appearance, from its evil eye, here the Grias evil eye. Because demonic is not the word, but always, as Benjamin writes at the end of the origin of the German tragic drama, the knowledge of it. The raw mass, the roche masse, I take uh, the expression from Warburg's very interesting notes on Burkhardt, the raw mass knowledge turns to is not demonic in itself, exactly because it is still raw, formless, umbra profunda, in the words of Bruno, fruitful, still indeterminate force, where too we must always return to break the shells, as Warburg writes in the Bruno notes, that lock us. The Congress uh, of uh, Aesthetics Warburg was going to, to take part was postponed, as the Dorothea McEwan reconstructs in her Van der Strass and der Kultur, Anyway, Warburg wouldn't have been able to be there because he died, as we have seen, a few months before the decided date. But a few years later, at the Second International Congress of Aesthetics that was held in Paris in uh, 1937, Paul Valéry also proposes an energetic idea of aesthetics. Fabrizio Desideri has considered this aspect of the uh, discours sur l'esthétique discourse on aesthetics that Valéry pronounced it at the Congress. Sensation is described here as the occasion of a mutual transformation between physical and mental. Sensation is actually, Valéry says, et in cell et lumière, éveil, appel, invasion, spark and light, awakening, call, invasion. Spark and awakening, that brings to mind, of course, Benjamin's thought in the Arcades project about awakening and about the dialectical image as a, an image, I quote, flashing up in the now of its recognizability. The history continuum then goes to pieces, as we have seen very well also now with uh, Cornelia's talk, and past and present come together in a flash. It is actually the same energy that smashes in Bruno the shells of the ancient cosmos, the beasts fixed in the sky. But this uh, energy is not, this is important, and we understand it very well from Benjamin's idea of dialectical image. This energy is not a mere immediacy, an ecstatic rush that leaves the past behind. 
Banyan in Rights in the Arcades project that, I quote, in the dialectical image, what has been within a particular epoch is always, simultaneously, what has been from time immemorial. And for this reason, that he reveals the newest as the oldest, Adorno writes about Benjamin that his gaze is a Medusa gaze. Yet Benjamin writes something else which is also very important. He writes, I quote, that only dialectical images are not archaic images. The antiquity the dialectical image discovers inside modernity is maybe then something different from the fixed appearance of myth that Adorno writes about in his Benjamin essay. It is rather, and I'm concluding, it is rather that with Benjamin words, that kind of authentic and shriveled antiquity Keller's writings are filled with. And it is the antiquity that in one of the most beautiful passages that according to Benjamin Valéry wrote in the Opalinos, takes the form of a strange object Socrates finds on the shore, a puzzling object, Benjamin writes, ivory or marble or animal bone, une forma dut, Valéry writes. It is definitely then this antiquity, the secret, the secret core of phenomena, that which in the encounter with phenomena precedes and exceeds every image and every imagination of uh, it. Um, to save the phenomena, according to Benjamin, would mean then to go back to their secret core, to their forma dut, to their being fertile. What distinguishes a truly general phenomenon is its fertility, Benjamin quotes from Valéry in the Arcades project. For this reason, maybe, the giant compass Benjamin imagines as Ex Libris for Valéry, in the tribute essay he composes for Valéry's 60th birthday, has one arm stretched out wide, wide toward the horizon and the other firmly anchored in the seabed. There, where Keller's last star shines and where these strange creatures live, here our Medusa, that Valéry calls beings of matter beyond compare, translucent and sensitive, flesh of glass, absurdly unstable, long-living strings, like uh, varbus snakes and like the Medusa servet Calvino docet, Calvino teaches, one must uh, handle with care. <laughs>